Okay, we will continue. Is this the third hour or fourth hour? Third? Okay, feels like fifth for me. <laughs> no, um, uh, it's because the, the material is uh, quite heavy. Uh, and <laughs> waiting, thank you. Uh, and, and no, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, tell you that uh, you know, some of these topics may cause you to ask more questions. It's good to ask questions, but uh, forgive me if I don't have answers to your questions. Uh, and some of these uh, questions are, are uh, very difficult. Uh, you know, uh, why did God say, uh, God, why did God not say it was good on the second day? You know, I, I just threw out the connection to the, the flood. Uh, and, you know, there might be other reasons, but this is one, one thing that we see. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that happened from that point is if we are following the, the genealogy context, uh, Genesis chapter 5, the 10 generations, the, they preserve the seed of God, the holy seed. But then after that, sons of God, you know, the, the good seed, saw the beauty of the other seed, right? And they were, they got themselves married, meaning connected to them. And God lost, basically, the children of God were lost. And I'm suspecting God is not happy about that, right? Did God know about this before? I'm sure he did. Uh, but that's why God has his salvation plan, a redemption plan. And, through, and these are not just history. We have to apply this to us. Okay? When will God say it is good when he sees us versus when will he, say, when will he not say it is good about our life? So we are going to continue on. Uh, the generations that came after the flood, the 10 generations in Genesis chapter 11, from Shem, Noah's son, all the way to Abraham. So remember, genealogies are concise roadmaps that show the coming of Christ. They summarize redemptive history in a short, compressed manner which helps us to grasp the vast history in mind in our minds. However, this is only good if you know how to decompress the genealogies, sort of like zip files, as I mentioned yesterday. If you can't unzip the files, they are useless. As such, genealogies are only useful if, we, if the Holy Spirit helps us to unpack them and the information so that they can be understood. Another thing about genealogies, especially when we go to the Matthew genealogy, there are generations that are skipped. Uh, this is in the third book in the History of Redemption series. Generations that skip. But it says, uh, such, and su such and such begot such and such. But in between, if you, if you we don't know, but... Uh, through the studies and researches that, that uh, the author has presented to us in the book, we, I came, personally, I came to realize, wow, there's a big skip between these generations. Right? So what does that mean? But it still shows it as though this man was the father of this. In actuality, he is the great, 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 great grandfather of this guy, right? And so that makes us wonder, what does it mean to be a father of somebody in, in this genealogical concept? To be a father of somebody means to pass down that faith in this covenantal genealogy, okay? I explained that to explain this. So age at begetting. Noah had his, we, we figured out earlier, right? Noah had his first son at 502. 
And he lived 448 years after that and lived 950 years altogether. So we'll write down uh, the age at beginning first. Shem, we read earlier, at 100 had Arpashad. And Arpashad had Shela at 35. Shela had Eber at 30. This is in Genesis chapter 11, okay? Uh, Eber had Peleg at 34. Peleg had Ru at 30. Ru had Saruk at 32. Saruk had Nahor at 30. Nahor had Terah at 29. And Terah had Abraham at 70. And how many more years did they live? Shem lived 500 more years and lived altogether 600 years, died at 600. Uh, Arpashad had uh, lived 403 more years and Shela also lived 403 more years, 403 years more. And so 438 and 433. And then Eber lived 430 more years and altogether 460, 64, right? 464 years. And Peleg lived 209 more years, and so 239 altogether. And Ru lived 207 more years, so 239 altogether. And Saruk lived 200 more years, so 230 altogether. And then Nahor lived 119 more years and 148 years together. And then Terah lived 135 more years altogether, 205. <clears throat> what do you see here? What do we see? Let us focus on this age at death. How long did they live? Do you see some kind of pattern or reduction or yeah, where and where? From big big reduction in the longevity in this line. And then here. Do you see that? Of course, from here to here too, but big jump from 600s to 600 and above to 400s. You have the 400 group, and then below 200, 200s and below. What happened in between Shem and Arpakshad and Eber and Peleg? There is a sudden reduction of human lifespan. And there are two places in the genealogy where there is a sudden reduction of lifespan. Once after Shem and second after Eber. Why? So let us think about after Shem. Okay? After the flood. After the flood. After Shem meaning after the flood. right? And there are great changes that took place on earth. So that environment was not as conducive to long life for human beings. First, topographical changes. Psalm 104 verses 6 through 8. You covered it with, talking about the earth, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters were standing above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled and the sound, at the sound of your thunder they hurry, hurried away. The mountains rose the valley sank down to the place which you established for them. What is this talking about? Huge global scale tsunamis. The mountains rose and valleys sank, right? The, the plates, you know, ge geographical continents and plates shifted. Some scientists say before, the, the continents were probably all uh, joined together, but they were broken afterwards. This is, this is again, uh, a view. Okay. Second change that took place was climatic, climatic changes. Okay. Seasons began. Now, there was extreme 
after the flood, there was extreme heat and extreme cold on earth. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, this is Genesis 8, 22, after the flood. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold. This is, in the original language, extreme cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Okay. What causes seasonal changes on earth? It is the tilt of the earth that brings different seasons for different regions of the earth. After the uh, tsunami, big tsunami in Japan, they say the earth, earth's axis shifted 0, 0.0, how many percent uh, uh, degree? Uh, but this was a tsunami over the whole earth. And so uh, these scientists are saying that the axis was tilted and now the earth is 23.5 degrees tilted. The flood covered the entire earth, which most likely caused the earth to tilt, thus causing the changes of seasons. The flood brought about such drastic changes to the environment, leading to the reduction of human life, lifespan. Ultimately, the flood was judgment upon sin. Genesis 6.5 and 6.13. Thus, we can say that sin was the main cause behind reduction of human life. Psalm 55, verse 23. But you, O God, will bring them down to the pit of destruction. Men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days, but I will trust in you. See, from the 900s to 400s, about half, the, half their longevity. From 400s to 200s, that's another half. There is another scientific, scientific uh, theory that before the flood, you know, the, when the flood, the waters from above came down. And I, I should change the, the language there. Uh, waters from the sky came down. Okay? I'm not talking about the waters above, uh, above in the second day. Waters came down from above. Waters came up from below, right? And they say uh, before the flood, there was a layer of water in the, above the atmosphere of the earth. That big layer of water, and there is water up underneath the, the earth. And so this, these are the scientists that are saying there was no need for rain. Because that mist, the, the humidity was provided for all the need for the water underneath, coming from underneath and coming from above. Another thing is that the layer of water prevented all the bad rays from outside. You know, we, UV ray and everything, with the, you know, everything that our sunscreen the reason why we put on our sunscreen. And all that was prevented and created a, a, almost a perfect environment for mankind to live on this earth. And it created the pressure from above, the water above and the pressure from, the, from water below created a hyperbaric. Anybody know what that means? Hyperbaric? Uh, when... Athletes get injured. They, there is a chamber called hyperbaric chamber. There is more oxygen, oxygen, and and so they go in there for faster recuperation. I think uh, this was used for in I forget what year, but there was a little child that was that fell into a a, a pit. Uh, or well, and she was rescued. She was almost dead, but she was put into this hyperbaric chamber, and she recovered. And so this uh, enough of oxygen, overflow of oxygen, causes the body to re recuperate. And, and so basically the whole earth 
was in that kind of hyperbaric environment. And so there was a Japanese uh, scientist uh, who did an did a experiment with uh, like cherry tomatoes and you know, these vegetations and created a, a hyperbaric environment for them. And these cherry tomatoes became like watermelon size and you know, they grew really big and, and so on. So that probably caused the people to you know, be, be bigger and also healthier and live longer life. But after the flood, that layer of water is gone. It all fell down, right? And, and so after that, and the earth was tilted, the UV rays started to penetrate, and so on. So probably the cause, one of those or combination of those became the cause of shorter life afterwards. But like... This statement says that was all caused by sin, going away from God, rejecting to be God's children. Romans chapter 1. Verses 18 and the following. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God's, God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So it is, God is saying, God made everything evident so that people know God's presence and God's exist, existence. But, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was made, what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of incorruptible, a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is what happened. That brought about the wrath of God. Second place where we see the reduction was from Peleg onward. Eber lived to be 464, but his son Peleg lived only 239 years. And that, tends, that trend continues in the 200s for the subsequent generations. Why such reduction there? Uh, we can think about the name Peleg and its meaning. The name Peleg means division, separate or split. It seems that the meaning of that name gives us a clue as to what happened. Genesis chapter 10, verse 25. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Yokdan or Joktan. Here, the, the, it says, for in, let us go to the Bible. Two sons were born to Eber, right? One was Peleg and the other was Jokdan. And it says, it has a description for Peleg. For in his days, the earth was divided. What is he talking about? And then it says, Jokdan became the father of Amodad, Shalef, and Hazamaveth, and Jera, and, and so on and on and on. <laughs> And then uh, verse 30, now their settlement extended from Mesha as to go toward Shephar, Shephar, the hill country of the east. So here we see uh, Jokdan, the two sons, and Jokdan's, Jokdan and his sons move away to the east. Okay? 
And Peleg, it, again, during the time of Peleg, the worlds were divided. Here, when it says the earth was divided in Peleg's days, it is an allusion to the Tower of Babel incident. And it was during, the, you calculate the, the number of years and their age, it was about that time. Genesis chapter 11, verses 8 through 9. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. This is talking about the Tower of Babel. We know about this. And the Lord scattered them by changing their language, confusing their language, and they started to scatter around. So you see, the earth was divided because of the Tower of Babel incident. First, it was divided by languages because God confused the languages. But it was also divided because of principles of faith. There were some who did not want to participate in this work because they knew that it was a direct defiance and challenge against God, the Tower of Babel. So there was division even within the family according to their faith. Even Jesus said that such a division will happen because of him. Luke chapter 12, 15, 51 through 53. So now, do you think descendants of Noah and Shem also participated in the building of the Tower of Babel? Do you think that pleased God? Do you think God would say, that is good? And this is a result of the, the mixing, the result of the sons of God mixing with the daughters of men. This is not only physical uh, intercourse or getting married. It is about mixture of philosophy and ideologies, ways of life. And so that separation took place during the time of Peleg. Okay? And we see, that we see evidence from the times of the, the Tower of Babel and also uh, direct, direct evidence between uh, Peleg and Jokdan. Okay? Uh, some scholars, I'm not saying this is right or wrong, I'm just letting you know, some scholars believe that Jokdan went eastward. Right? and became the forefathers of China and Asia and, and so on. And you can see traces of uh, biblical understanding in the Chinese characters and in, in some of the historical uh, matters, aspects. But here, there's another evidence. Uh, some scholars want to believe this, or some scholars don't want to believe this, but here's, I, I, I've personally been there. Uh, let's just put it out there. It's boasting here. Uh, uh, Syria, Syria, before the war began. Uh, I, went, I was there to translate, but uh, I was able to see this place. Here, archaeology can help us to recreate the situation between Eber and Eber and Peleg. It seems that Eber most likely tried to stop his son from participating in the sin of building the Tower of Babel. But he would not listen, so he left. Who left? Eber left. Eber, Eber, Eber. Okay. Oh, this disappears. Eber is uh, Eber means to cross a river. Okay. Also means come out of water. You know when you're crossing the river and you walk, walk out, coming out of the water, right? Kind of like Jonah coming out of the water. Uh, the, crossing the Red Sea, coming out of the water, crossing the river. Okay? It means to cross the river. And from here comes the word Ibri, which is Hebrew. Okay? 
And so when people were calling Abraham, you're a Hebrew, they were saying, you're the one that crossed over. You're a foreigner. Right? When I first migrated to the uh, U.S., they called me FOB, FOB. Do you know what that means? Yes, fresh off the boat. He said, fresh off the boat, because I wore different kinds of clothes, different colors that, you know, that stood out, and I had different kind of hairstyle, I guess, and different language and different accent in English. They said, you're, you're different. You're a foreigner, and they called it FOB. Kind of like that, Hebrew. The one that crossed over the river to, to be here. So it seems that Eber most likely uh, crossed over to go away from this, this area of this culture of building the Tower of Babel. Sort of like the Puritans or pilgrims. Eber most likely, uh, the ancestor, Eber and the ancestors like Noah and Shem, they were still alive right, during the Tower of Babel. Left as well in search of a place where they can practice their unadulterated orthodox faith without being persecuted or ridiculed and without temptations. Archaeologists have found thousands of clay tablets near the modern-day Aleppo, which is in Syria. The tablets revealed inf uh, information about a kingdom called Ebla, and they found inscriptions that refer to the name of God and refer to some of these names in the genealogy that we recognize. And it seems that this, his kingdom was founded, this kingdom was founded by a person named Eber, Eber. Moreover, the kingdom of Ebla was a kingdom that believed in God. And this is, uh, you know, in the northern side of, of Israel. Okay? So Eber left with their home, left their home near Ur, where Abraham is from, and also crossed the river Euphrates and went up from somewhere near Aleppo and settled there and built a kingdom that believed in God. Interestingly, the name Eber, I already uh, shared with you, uh, means one who crossed over. So, Let's take a look at, look at this chart again. It's kind of hard to see how long they lived and uh, who was alive at what age. But, whoa, who, who changed the information here? 600 and then 430, uh, 430, 438. So, uh, but, but some, something we can calculate. It says Shem was 100 years old after, uh, two years after the flood, right? So this is two years after the flood, Arpakshad was born. And 35 years after that, Shela was born. 30 years after that, so on, right? So that means... You add 2 plus 35 plus 30 plus 34 plus 30 plus 32 plus da, 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 you get 292. 292 years after the flood is when Abraham was born. Okay? 292 years after the flood, Abraham was born. Now you're wondering, who was alive when Abraham was born? Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. And after that, he lived 350 more years after the flood. Was Noah alive when Abraham was born? Yes. How, how, many, how old was Abraham when Noah died? 350 minus 290. Two. Fifty-eight years. 
Abraham was 58 years old when Noah died. So Noah was alive. But take a look. Uh, if Noah went to went crossed over and went away with Eber, do you think Abraham would have met Noah? Did Abraham go with him? No. Abraham stayed with his father. Abraham's father, Terah, his grandfather, Nahor, great-grandfather, Seruk, Ru, Peleg. Were these good people? They remained in awe of the Chaldeans. Let us turn to Joshua chapter 24. Where is it? Joshua 24 verse 2, if you can see this. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your, forf your fathers lived beyond the river. Beyond the river meaning back in Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay? Namely, Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. This is another evidence that from the time of Peleg, things were changing. And even the people in this genealogy started to go down. Okay. So it is much later that God called Abraham or Abram from Ur of the Chaldeans, leave this country. So we will, oh, we still have 10 minutes, right? Conclusion. God brought Abraham out of this country and made him into a new beginning. Started a new nation with him. There are Jewish writings about how Abraham had faith even in Ur of the Chaldeans. How did he have faith when his father Terah was an idol worshiper? And there's Jewish writings that give us evidence that uh, Terah was an, actually an idol maker. Okay. Terah, how terrible he was. <laughs> I had to wake you up, you know. <laughs> so there's Terah and his father Nahor, Seru, Ru, they were not good people. The Bible tells us, uh, we don't know how, up to how many generations, but the fathers, plural, generations above Abraham were idol worshippers. How did Abraham come to believe in God? It must be the, that must be the reason why God allowed Noah to live until that point. It's a little bit different with Noah and his forefathers. His father Lamech, we see evidence that he held on to the covenant of God. And so Adam died before Noah's, Noah was born. Noah was still able to inherit that faith. Abraham had nobody. His father was an idol maker. The whole region was a tower of Babel region. So it was very, very against God. How did he believe in God? That must be, it must be an influence. And so let us finally, uh, before we go into break, think about who received that covenant, who inherited that covenant. Genesis chapter 9, verse 25. So he said, this is after Ham sinned and was cursed and uh, he will, he said, so he said, Cursed be Canaan, servant of servants. He shall be to his brothers. And also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And let Canaan be his servant. Now, we have to try to trace where the covenant and the blessing of God goes to. From Shem, uh, from Noah, it goes to Shem. He says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. So Shem is blessed with, uh, he's the one that inherited this faith. Okay? 
And from here, there's another passage in ch chapter 10, verse 21. It says, Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. So who receives this blessing of faith? From Noah to Shem. And Shem had other sons, Arpaksha, Shela, Eber. But then it says, the father, Shem is the father of all children of Eber. I explained to you the concept of being, fathering someone. Fathering someone in the biblical genealogical concept is passing down that faith, that covenant. So Shem became the father of Eber. So we can see that Eber must have inherited that faith. And Eber is the one that crossed over the river to preserve faith. So again, conclusion, God brought Abraham out of his country and made him into a new beginning. Started a new nation with him. So now, uh, we can see uh, the world were mixed and confused. The sons of God, daughters of men, people in the genealogy of, of God's lineage, the people in the genealogy of Cain's lineage, all Ham's lineage, all mixed up, and even the people of uh, God are following the ways of the Tower of Babel. What are we going to do? What's God going to do? And so he seeks, he finds one man again. And his name is Abraham. The, the waters were covered. The waters of sin covered the, the, the whole world. But Abraham is like the seed that appears out of the water. The waters abate, go away. Land appears, right? Like the third day. When the land appears, land means potential, possibility of the seed being sowed and bearing fruit. The seed of God, where can the seed of God land? Like after the, ark, after the flood, Noah sends out the raven. Noah sends out the doves, right? The dove, three times. And finally finds a place where the, the seed became tree and the olive, the olive tree is there, right? Looking for that land, Likewise, it's the, the image of the ark hovering over the, the waters is like the image of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep. And then he creates light, and then the third day, waters go away, and there is land. Discovering Abraham and his faith was kind of like that. The, water, the whole world was covered with the waters of sin, but he moves away, and Abraham finds Abraham. Okay, I have probably two minutes left. Uh, I, I, before we go on to the uh, next hour, we're going to talk, talk about Abraham and finish. But uh, let me spend just a couple minutes. Uh, I think our brother Mark found the verses, two verses in the Bible that tell us don't study genealogy. Which verses are they? Titus 3.9 But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law for they are un profitable and worthless you've spent the last two days <laughs> a worthless unprofitable thing uh, what's the other verse it's first timothy 1 4 probably is it three Did I not find the right passage? Oh, Thessalonians. First Timothy. First Timothy 1. 4, yeah. Nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation. 
So we've been speculating. Rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Oh my goodness. What have we done? Uh, Okay. If you look at it carefully, uh, in the original language, the genealogies that we are studying is Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's what we're studying. Okay? Here in Greek, is the genealogy is... Genet, oops, Geneseos, Geneseos, okay, and this is the record of the years, okay, years and, and names, the, so, so the record, okay, and genealogy. But the two verses that we just read, uh, Titus and 1 Timothy, the, both of them are Geneologia. Different words. Geneologia are um, genealogy of men that are used to boast of my history, how good I am. You know, who's your dad? My dad is this kind of thing, right? My, my pedigree or my my status in the society. And they, they used to say, which tribe are you from? I'm from the tribe of Judah. Which tribe are you from? I'm tri- from the tribe of Levi. I'm the Kohen. I'm, I am the, the priest gener- genealogy. So you need, I am better than you kind of thing. These two passages are saying, don't count, don't, let, don't look at these genealogies as human genealogies that define you, right? Just because you are Korean, Chinese, or, you know, or, you know Panamanian, doesn't mean you, are, you cannot enter into the genealogy of Jesus Christ. This genealogy, Geneseos, is the genealogy of God's covenant. And Isaiah chapter 56 tell us, even if you're a Gentile, don't say you cannot enter into God's assembly. Even if you are a eunuch, you know what eunuch is? Don't say you're a dry stick. <laughs> dry tree. Cannot bear fruit. As long as you keep the covenant of God and the Sabbath of God, you are my people, God says. And in the genealogy of Jesus, there are Canaanites, Canaanite women, sinful women, prostitutes, and Moabites women. These are Gentiles. You know, Jesus is not pure, pure Jew. But these people who are condemned, God said, you will not, Moabites will not enter into the general assembly of God's children. But she got into Jesus' genealogy and became Jesus' grandmother. How? So this is not a physical lineage that human beings boast of, but God is saying you have to understand the genealogy of his covenant and understand how that covenant came to you, how you became Jesus' children. Amen? And another thing about Matthew chapter 1 genealogy, it says, 14 generations, this is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. 14 generations, 14 generations, and 14 generations. We're out of time, but please do your calculation. 14 times 3, what is that? 42. Here's another homework. Count all the names. How many names are there in that genealogy? Should be 42 names. We'll see you after the break. (laughs) 